But if you'll turn in your Bibles to the book of 1 Timothy chapter 2, 1 Timothy chapter 2, God has a, has a great <clears throat> desire and a longing to be gracious to us. Um, that's been his plan since the beginning when he created Adam and Eve and he prepared everything in the garden, everything that he thought they might need or even thought they might want or desire, not just to meet their physical uh, uh, needs, but also he made everything beautiful. He, he, you know, he made everything good to look at and food good to taste. He made everything for them with them in mind. God created everything he created with man in mind, thinking about us. Again, desiring to be gracious to us, desiring that, uh, that we would not desire or want anything, desiring that we would look to him for everything that we needed, everything that we wanted, everything that we desired. God says, I'm it for you. I'm it for you. Uh, and thus uh, causing us or should have a response of, of awe and respect towards God as well. In uh, 1 Timothy, let's look at this. 1 Timothy chapter 2. And we're going to start at verse 1. 1 Timothy chapter 2. And verse 1. Let's read this out of the King James Version. It says, I exhort therefore that first of all, supplication and prayers and intercessions and giving of thanks be made for all men. So here uh, Paul is writing to Timothy and he's saying, you know, we need to pray for all men. We need to make supplication and intercession for all men. He said for kings and for all that are in, the, uh, in authority that we may lead a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and honesty. So at this particular point in time, um, the Christian people were kind of bumping heads with people who were in authority, uh, with um, kings and with those who were placed over them. And God is letting them and helping them to understand that, you know, I know they're causing you a challenge, but because of how I think about men, how I think about people, he says, I want you to pray for them anyway. I want you to make supplication for them. You know, not just a quick little prayer. Let me just throw, you know, God bless them. He says, no, no, no. He says, I, I want you to, I want you to be, be, be earnest about what you're doing. He says, again, he said, I want you to pray. He says, supplications. Now, supplication is a deep yearning. It's not, again, that just that passive prayer, but it's one where it digs real down deep where you are earnestly praying for those who are in authority over you. He says, pray prayers. He said, make intercession for them. He says, giving thanks be made for all men. He says, I want you to pray for all people, even those people that seem to be causing you a challenge, even those people who seem to rub you the wrong way. He said, because I need for you to understand how I see men. Understand how I see people. Understand that I'm God and I created men for myself. And he says, you know, I, I don't want anybody to go uh, without me. I don't want anybody to uh, not know who I am and how gracious I am and how good I am. So I'm asking you to do something that I know rubs against the grain. He said, but I'm asking you to do it because it's according to my purpose. It's according to what I desire to take place and what I desire to happen. He says, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of of our, of our, of God, our savior, who will listen to the verse four, who will have all men be saved. God said, it is my desire that all men be saved. <clears throat> That's my desire. That's what I want. I want it to become your desire that you want all men to be saved. Um, I had an occasion once when uh, my daughter uh, was in school and she kept talking about some uh, students who she said they, they, they're just not good people they you know they say and do things to other students they make them mad you know they just they're just not good people and she was talking about how you know I, I you know I don't like them and I, I looked at her and I said Crystal 
I said, the thing about it is, is if God doesn't intervene in their lives, they're just going to become adult people just like that. So I think we need to pray for them that they would come to know God so that they won't grow up and spend the rest of their lives acting like this. Because this is, this is, again, this is God's desire. He says, my desire is that all men be saved. He said, and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. He said, they need to know the truth. And again, when I think about knowing the truth, I think about the name of the church. I don't believe people don't want God. I just think they don't know the truth about God. I don't think they've been exposed to how gracious and how good God is and how God longs and, and to be gracious to them. They don't understand uh, God's thoughts and his thinking. They don't understand how compassionate God really is and how God wants to be their God so they don't live their whole lifetime chasing things that are not going to ever satisfy them. Because God, according to the word of God, has put something on the inside of all of us that desire to know him. And they don't know that it is God, so they're chasing after things and never, ever satisfying this thirst and this hunger that's on the inside of them, which is God. So we as born-again believers, we as Christians, are supposed to take on the attributes and the attitude of God and not looking at a group of people and saying, you know what, you just lost, you just outcast, you know, God don't even want you. That's not how God is looking at that because he said in the book of uh, uh, John chapter 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave. And when he said so loved the world, he wasn't talking about those who were just good. He was talking about all men. God so loved the whole world, every man born. He said that he gave his only begotten son. And of course, if you keep reading that in uh, 17, it expresses it more. He says, for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He said, I didn't send Jesus to condemn people. I didn't send Jesus to point out all your errors. I didn't send Jesus to, uh, to get you prepared to go to hell. I didn't send Jesus for that. I sent Jesus as a representation of who I am and that I love all men and my desire is that all men come to know me. That all men become acquainted with me. That all men become, become personally attached to me. That's why I sent Jesus. Again, we look at that and we see where he's talking about that uh, he sent Jesus. He loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. So whosoever believes in should not perish. But then you have to always look at the rest of that. But have eternal life. And then you have to figure out what eternal life means. It does not mean just live forever. Eternal life means that we are acquainted with God. We know God. We have an opportunity to come close to God. That's what eternal life is. When you become born again, eternal life starts the day you get born again. Because that is your introduction to God. And God is now open to hear you. So God is saying, that's my desire for every man. I need for that to be your desire also. I want every man. Every man to be saved, every man to come into the knowledge of the truth concerning me. And then he says, he in coming into the knowledge of God's truth, uh, let's look at Ezekiel chapter 33. Let's look at Ezekiel chapter 33 in the King James Version. God, his, his, his longing for us is sometimes more intense than what we think it is. Ezekiel chapter 33, looking at verse 11. And this is what he says, say unto them, are you there? Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 11. We don't go there much, but he says, say unto them, as I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. He said, that, that's my desire. I'm, I'm, I, 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 I'm not after punishing people. I'm not, that's not my goal. I, I, that's not my objective in life. It's to harm and hurt people and, again, point out all their faults. And 
we taking on the persona, we taking on the personality of Jesus, we have to think the same way. When we see people who don't know God, we should, we should have a compassion for them. We shouldn't have a, let me turn my nose up at you, and you must not go know God, and you don't know Jesus, and I don't know why you're acting like that, and you are heathen, and you're going straight to hell. God said that, 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 he said that all may be true, but that's why I got you. That's why you need to know what I think. You need to know how, you need to come into the knowledge of the truth of who I really am. And unfortunately, and God's, it's a balance. It's, it's, it's things that we balance. God is our provider. God wants to provide for us. Or he wants us to allow him to provide for us. Let me put it that way. God wants us to have peace. Because with peace, then we're not distracted by what's going on with us that we cannot minister to other people. But then when we got born again, God gave us a ministry. He said it's a ministry of reconciliation. It's, it's, it's supposed to be a ministry that, that causes people to come to me, not run away from me or run away from you. So I need for you to have the same kind of mindset, but then you got to know the truth of how I really see things how I feel about things. Let's look at Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, because when you, when you began in the Old Testament and you began to read, it appears to those on the outside that God was only for the uh, Israelites or he was only for uh, uh, his people that he brought out of Egypt. That's who God is for. But then in Romans chapter 3, in verse 29, it's cleared up. Paul clears it up. He says, or is God merely the God of Jews? Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Then he answers the question. He says, yes, of Gentiles also. Because God's chosen people had the same type of mindset. That God is just for us. And you guys are on the outside. God's going to do good for us. But you don't have a chance. God's not for you. And, of course, people on the outside watch God blessing God's people. He, they, watch, he, we, they watch, you know, the, the Red Sea. They, they watch God give to people, and they were on the outside. But God still had us in mind because that's how good God is. That's how gracious God is. So he says, God is for the Gentiles also. And in Romans chapter 15, He said he's for us also. Of course, um, the Jewish people had a question concerning that because it's like, so, you know, how, how, how is it that you're for them? You gave us the law, and, and now you're telling us that we're not uh, uh, supposed to be justified or we don't get in good standing you, with you concerning uh, obeying the law, and that's exactly what Book of Romans is all about. If you read the Book of Romans, you will find that God is letting everybody, whether you are of the circumcision or whether you, they call them Gentiles, those who were not a part of the chosen group of people, he's letting them know nobody has a place to boast here. All of you need a savior. Mm -hmm. All of you have done things that are against me. Yeah. He said, even when I gave you the law, talking to the Jewish people, he said, I gave you the law, you weren't able to keep it. So you broke the law, so you need Jesus. Then he looks at the Gentiles. He says, don't say you didn't give us the law, God, and therefore uh, uh, that, you know, we are accountable. He says, well, he said, I put it on the inside of you. You knew you weren't supposed to kill other people. You knew you weren't supposed to steal. He says, so you knew a law within your own self. So everybody needs Jesus. And so therefore the book of Romans is putting everybody on the same playing field. He says, everybody's in the same place. Everybody needs Jesus. So that you won't think you're good because I gave you the law and you don't think that, you, you, that you, I should excuse you because you didn't have the law. He said, everybody, he said, everybody in the world is at the same place. So I got to make it so it's even. So how did he make it even? He says, if you believe in Jesus, whether you circumcise or whether you are uncircumcised, you all can come to me. I got to make it all even. Again, God is trying to get it so that every man can be saved. 
that you don't have to be of a particular religion. You don't have to be of a particular race. You don't have to be of a particular sex. He said, all men, look at somebody say, all men. Amen. God wants all of us. Everybody born in the human race, he wants everybody to know about him. He wants everybody to understand that I love you with a deep compassion and I want to be gracious to you. Romans chapter 15. Starting at verse 8, he says, For I tell you that Christ the Messiah became a servant and a minister to the circumcised, the Jews, in order to show God's truthfulness and honesty by confirming, verifying the promises given to our fathers. He said, you know, I, I, I want to verify this. He said, um, he said, I want you to know I'm truthful. I keep my word. I gave my word to your ancestors and I'm keeping it. Then he says, and also in order that the Gentile, the nations, might glorify God for his mercy, not because of the covenant he had with them, but because of his mercy. So we are justified and God brings us in. He said, because of my mercy concerning you, I did not give you the covenant that I gave them. I did not, I didn't make an agreement with you concerning you keeping the law. That's not what I did. I didn't give you the Ten Commandments. That's what he's telling the Gentiles. I didn't do that to you. He says, you are, you are in good standing with me, or you come in good standing with me, or you have the opportunity because of my mercy for you. Because I just want to be gracious to you. So again, God is putting everybody on the same playing field, and he's saying that, you know what? I'm God, and I want all of you. Not just some of you, I want all of you. Then he goes on to say, again, it is said, rejoice. Exalt, O Gentiles, along with his own people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all people praise him. And further said Isaiah, further Isaiah says, there shall be a sprout from the root of Jesse, he who rises to rule over the Gentiles, in him shall the Gentiles hope. So he is making it very clear here that I just didn't come for the circumcision or the circumcised. I came for the Gentiles too. He said, you should be excited. You should be more than, 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 than just happy. You should exalt and glorify God's name because I engrafted you in, because I brought you in. He said, you should be excited about the fact that I want to be gracious to you too because you watched me be gracious to, to, the, to, to the circumcised. You watched me do wonderful acts and things for me. You watched them and you, you were outside of it. That's what it says in Ephesians. You were outside and God was not on your side. Not at all. Can you imagine living your life as a believer with God not being on your side today? Could you imagine not having someone to pray to, someone to go to? Could you imagine not, not having, seeing a Bible, but, un, but looking at it and understanding these promises made in this word of God did not apply to you? Could you imagine not having God on your side? He said, so you should, he said, you should be gracious to God. You should be happy. We should be excited every time we read in this Bible and understand that the promises are for us as well. It should create a joy on the inside of us, understanding we're not on the outside. Because if you will recall, Pharaoh was by God's, God's plan, kept coming against God. He says, there are vessels of honor and vessels of dishonor. And he says, I use Pharaoh as a vessel of dishonor so that I can show my people how much I love them. Aren't you glad you're not used as a vessel of dishonor? Because every time that Pharaoh would be nice to the people, God would harden his heart. He would make him go against them. And thus chasing them and all dying in the Red Sea. God said, I could have left you outside to prove that I loved another group of people. But that's not what I did. He said, I brought you in. I offered you my salvation. I offered you my graciousness. I'm offering it to every man. I'm offering you my peace. I'm offering you my joy. 
I'm offering you my strong arm that can change situation. I'm offering you my abilities. I'm offering you my might. I'm offering you my wisdom. I'm offering you all of me. Guess what? Not because I made an agreement with you, but because I want to have <laughs> mercy on you. Because I want to show that I am the merciful God and that I want all men to be saved. He said, these are things you ought to know. These are things that you need to exalt in. These are things that you need to be grateful to God about. When you get up in the morning, you understand I've been engrafted in. You get up in the morning and I can call myself a Christian. You get up this morning and get up in the morning and understand that God is for me and he's not against me. You get up in the morning and you understand and can relate to the fact that God did not have to do it, but he did it anyway because he was a merciful God. Thank God for his mercy. Thank God for his mercy. Let's look at Galatians. Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. Sometimes we have to be reminded so that we can be grateful for the things that God is doing in our lives. I know that Pastor Benjamin has been talking to talking to you about uh, us mirroring the word and looking in the word of God. You know what? We ought to want to do that. We ought to want to uh, uh, do all that the word is asking us to do. We, because we're in, a, we're in a position that we did not have to be in. We're in a position that, that, that didn't come through a covenant with God. But we're in a position because of the mercy of God. His loving kindness. Uh, I don't know whether they do it now, uh, but uh, when I worked in insurance, automobile insurance, sometimes we get motor vehicle reports back, and um, it would have on there for a <coughs> ticket. It, uh, let me see. The language said uh, mercy plea, and I kept saying a mercy plea, which meant that I'm guilty, but I'm throwing myself on the, oh, what is it, mercy? The court of, uh, the mercy of the court? Yes, I, that's what I'm doing. And they didn't get any points for it. So that's the way God is with us. You know, it's like I'm extending you mercy so you don't get any points counted off for you for all the bad that you've done. So we got in, look at somebody say, we got in because of mercy. It was, see, it had nothing to do with what you did or how good you were. Amen. How, mor how, how, how the moral issues that you, you, because there are people who really think I'm okay if I'm morally good. Mm -hmm. I, I work with people like that. Yeah. They, 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 didn't, they didn't see, you know, I don't really have to go to church because I don't do things to people. And, and, and you know, God's going to be okay with me because I, I'm like, no, that is not how it happens. That's not how it works. No matter what good you have done, you still have transgressed against God. And you've got to get that straight. <laughs> I had one lady tell me, she said, my, my mother was a preacher. And she preached until she died. And, and God going to take that into account? I said, yeah, for her. <laughs> not for you. Every man has to give an account for himself, not other people. Uh, Galatians chapter 3. We're going to look at verse 8. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 8. And it says in the Amplified, And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify, declare righteous, put in right standing with himself the Gentiles in consequence of faith, proclaim the gospel, foretelling the glad tidings of a Savior long beforehand, listen, to Abraham in the promise, saying, in you shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. So God spoke of this through Abraham, but of course people didn't see it that way unless they had insight into what God was saying. But again, he says, and the scriptures foreseeing that God would justify, declare righteous, put in right standing with himself, the Gentiles, in consequence of faith, not because of covenant, 
but because of our faith, our belief in what Jesus Christ did for us. That's how we come into an agreement. That's how we come into a relationship with God is through our faith and believing what Jesus did for us. So therefore, we don't work our way into God's graciousness. We don't work our way into God's goodness. He says again here, foretelling of the glad tidings of a savior long beforehand to Abraham in the promise. So when he made a promise to Abraham that in you all nations shall be blessed, he was talking about us too. He says, so then those who are people of faith are blessed and made happy and favored by God as partners in fellowship with the believing and trusting Abraham. So he's telling us that it's through faith and believing what Jesus Christ did that brings us into a relationship with God. It's what we believe, it's not what we do. Because sometimes we tend to uh, go back into works. Sometimes we will uh, start to uh, get into the God's good graces by what we do and what we say. And in the fact that we're teaching you that you need to mirror the word, you don't need to make mirroring the word become a law in itself. In the fact that, okay, I'm mirroring the word, I'm doing this, so now God likes me. No, God likes you anyway. Look at somebody and say, God likes you anyway. <laughs> What you are doing in mirroring the word is you are responding to God's mercy. You're responding to God's love. Everything that we do concerning God needs to be a response to what he has given us. It's not a, it's because what, what we don't want to do as believers is leave a relationship with God and start justifying ourselves through what we do. The word of God tells us what we should look like. Paul talks about, you know, what the believer should look like and what we should think like. But let me tell you something. You're just doing that does not move God to be gracious to you. Your response to his love, your response to his mercy, your response to his compassion is a thing that should drive you or move you or motivate you to respond to God in the proper way. So that it is now a real relationship and not just these rules and regulations that we follow. We can even make the word of God a rule in itself. We look at the word and we say, God said I'm supposed to give, so let me give and God's going to like me. God says, no, you give because you like me. Yeah. Yeah. You, give because you, you give in response to me. That's what Abraham did. When Abraham went out to fight the battle and, and, and regain his, 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 his uh, relatives, he came back and the Bible says that he tithed to Melchizedek. Now, this was, this was not a law. He did it in response to God. Why he chose 10%, I don't know. Because the Bible doesn't say why he did it. But that's what he did. But he did it in response to God. And he looked at, he looked at um, Melchizedek and he says, you know what? I don't want anybody saying that they made me who I am. I don't want anybody saying that you prospered me because I look to God. He's the one who prospers me. He's the one who protects me. He's the one who strengthens me. He's the one who guides me. He's the one who had mercy on me. So I am responding by saying, here, here's 10% and here are all your men too because I don't want anybody to take the place of God. Nobody. So I respond in my giving. When I first started giving, I gave because I wanted to do something for God. It wasn't because somebody got up and said, you know, we're going to receive, in church I was in, dues, and we're going to receive offerings, and we're going to say, it had nothing to do. It was in my response to what I read in Proverbs. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not to thy own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. I'm like, God, you love me so much. I want to do something. I had been hearing climbing up the rough side of the mountain, and God's going to work it out. Just give it to Jesus. And all these things are true, but I finally thought to myself one day, then what can I do concerning God? Am I the one who always just has my hands out? 
Am I always just, just always begging God for something? Is there anything I can do, God? Is there anything I can do? I know I'm a mere man, but is there anything I can do concerning you? And God said, trust me with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. And God reciprocates by showing more favor. God reciprocates by showing more grace. God reciprocates by showing more love because that's the kind of God he is. He's a giving God. And it's only the selfish man who tries to use God. Yeah. It's only the selfish person who's trying to get God to do something for them by doing something for God. Mm-hmm. Are you all understanding what yeah. I'm saying? It's the selfish person that says, uh, I'm going to do this and then God's going to do this for me. God is like, I was doing it for you anyway. So now you're trying to manipulate me. Now you're trying to be good because you think I'm going to be good to you. Don't you understand? I, I, I'm good to you anyway. I extended you my mercy, invited you into my family, pretty much gave you the run of the household, eat from the table, take whatever you want. Then you get in, and then you're trying to manipulate me anyway. That's just like inviting somebody to your house and saying, you can have anything that you want in my house. Everything's open. Everything is, you know, open access to you. And then you walking in, you getting food, and you're like, I think this apple maybe costs 50 cents. Let me put 50 cents on the tape. And when people do that, that's because they don't want to owe anybody anything. That's why people a lot of times cannot receive uh, acts of kindness from people. I don't have a car. Oh, well, I'll pick you up, and I'll take you. Here, here, let me just, I don't want to owe you anything. And that's the way people are with God. I don't want to owe you anything, God. I don't really want to have to do what you say do. So I'm going to do this, and now you're going to respond this way, God, because I did that. And God says, that's not the response I want. He said, I want you to respond to me based upon your love for me, based upon the fact that I love you, based upon the fact that I showed you mercy. And that's a lot of times why people won't rely on God. They won't depend on God. They won't, they won't trust God. Because you think you've got to get God to do something. And God is saying, no, I, I, I'm all here to lavish it upon you. Now respond to me based upon my love concerning you. And I understand we we sing a lot of songs about how we love God, but we need to start singing a whole bunch of songs about how God loves us. That's the basis by which he does anything for us. It's because of his love for us, not what we do concerning him. He says that he would that all men be saved and come into the knowledge of the truth. Come into the knowledge of the truth. Let's look at John 17 and 17. God wants us to come into the knowledge of his truth. Here it reads, sanctify them, purify, consecrate, separate them for yourself. Make them holy by the truth. Your word is truth. He said, I want you to understand that I want you separate. He says, I want you to understand I want you for myself. He says, and it's the word of God that causes that to happen, that separation. That's what causes that to happen. Let's look at Philippians chapter 1 and verse 19. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 19. He's talking about coming into the knowledge of the truth. The truth of the word of God will sanctify us and separate us. In Philippians chapter 1 and verse 19 in the Amplified. Excuse me, verse 9, I apologize, verse 9. This is a prayer that Paul prays. He says, 
And this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more and extend to its fullest development in knowledge and all keen insight, that your love may be displayed, that your love may display itself in greater depth of acquaintance and more comprehensive discernment. So that you may, he said, this, this, this is why. He says, so that you may surely learn to sense what is vital and approve and prize what is excellent and of real value, recognizing the highest and the best and distinguishing the moral differences and that you may be untainted and pure and unerring and blameless so that with hearts sincere and certain and unsullied, you may approach the day of Christ not stumbling nor causing others to stumble. He said, you need to know the truth. You need to be ingrained in this love. You need to, your love need to abound so much so that it extends out to other people. He says, because when your love is full, when you understand the love of God and you abound in this love, he said, it causes you to choose properly. He said, it causes you to, to, to look at things in the right way. He says it, it keeps you from stumbling. It keeps you from falling. When you get your love walk right with God, when you understand how much God loves you and you start to respond to that love, he said you'll choose the right things. You'll choose the right things. He said you'll know how to choose what's vital. He said you'll know what's important. He said that we do these things with a sincere heart. And he said you'll be filled with the fruit of righteousness, meaning that you'll walk out your life. Uh, fruits of righteousness, those things that God gives us and puts upon us because of our right standing with him, the things that are open to us because of our right standing with him. And most of all, he said that you won't cause other people to stumble. That's what the truth does. And that again is a reason why we're talking about being disciples because we need to live this life truly. Because if you don't, you'll cause other people to stumble. You'll cause other people to go down the wrong uh, trail. You'll cause, and I, I know some people are like, but you know when I'm not up in front of people, you know, I'm just over here. Don't know I really, really care about what I'm doing. Oh, no. The Bible says when you got born again, you became a light. You became a light. And no matter how, how, how you might see your light, God still says that you're light. He says that you're salt. So you may think no one knows you, no one sees you. God says, someone, I'm sending somebody to look at you. I'm sending someone to get a clear vision of who I am. You are the light. Look at somebody say, you're the light. You're the light. We're the light of the world. And, and, and God is saying, you, you got to know the truth. Listen, people, you got to know the truth. It's not what you think. It's not what your cousins may have said. It's not what their opinion is. But you need to know the truth. Look at somebody say, you got to know the truth. You got to know the truth because the Bible says that, that the truth will make you free. Jesus said that. And Jesus was talking to a group of converts, Jewish people. He was talking to them. He, in, he, in, in actuality, he says the truth will make you free, but the truth you continue in makes you free. Not that you have the information, but you actively are responding to the truth that you hear. He says, that's the thing that's going to make you and keep you free. That's going to keep you free, the things that you participate in. Let's look at uh, Acts. Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4 and looking at verse 12. Acts chapter 4, verse 12 in the Amplified, and it says, And there is salvation in and through no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by and which we must be saved. He says that salvation only comes through Jesus. Jesus is the only one who can reconcile God and humanity. 
and he did it for the benefit of everybody, Jews, Gentiles, bond, free, every nation. God wants them reconciled to himself. And you may say, Pastor Deborah, this just sounds like a salvation message. Are you telling us about being saved and, and, and the grace of God? Yes, I am. Yes, I am. Because sometimes when we leave the foundation by which we came into the kingdom of God, then when we start to, when we start to build and there are cracks in the foundation, it's not a sturdy building. You find yourself wavering. You find yourself wondering. You find yourself uh, staying away from church. You find yourself not reading the Bible because you don't know the position you were in and the position you now are in, and you're not grateful about it. You're not, you're not, you're not excited about it. You're not, you're, most people, with the day they got born again, they were so excited, they tell everybody. They tell heathens. They tell anybody, I'm born again. I remember when I got saved and knew I really was saved. I was excited. I wanted everybody to know that I am saved. And sometimes we lose that excitement when we don't remember. When we don't remember how we came into the kingdom of God. When we don't remember how gracious God really is to us. When we don't remember uh, where we came from and the position God has placed us in. And then Satan takes advantage because you don't remember. And then you start to let all of the benefits or some of the benefits that God has offered to you slip away because you forgot that I'm in a good place. I'm in the best place I can be. I'm a born again believer. God says that we are his house. We're Jesus's house. That's found in Hebrews chapter three and verse six. He talks about us being his house. He says, but Christ, the Messiah, was faithful over his house. That, the verses before that says that, that Moses was faithful in his house, meaning that Moses was a servant, and he was, he, you know, he was praying for people. He was petitioning God on the people's behalf. He says, but Jesus is faithful over the house. He's not a servant in the house. He said Jesus is over the house. And he says, but Christ, the Messiah, was faithful over his own father's house as son and master of it. And it, is, and it is we who are now members of this house. If we hold fast and firm to the end, our joyful. He said, if we be joyful, hold, <laughs> hold firm to the end, our joyful and exultant confidence and sense of triumph in our hope in Christ. He said, you should have a sense of triumph. You should have a sense of hope. Hope is a confident expectation of good. When you get up and, you, and you're praying to God, you should have a confident expectation of good. God is going to work this out. God is going to see this through. God is going to give me the peace that I need. God is going to do this. He said, this is your expectation. Why? Because I'm the house. And God has sent Jesus to be over the house. And if Moses was faithful as a servant, what would the owner do? A servant has done what they're told. But when you own something, you take better care of it. Yes. When, you know the, when you know the value of it. When you know the value of it. If you were a, a, a person who, 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 who loved cars and I gave you the car of your dreams, I gave you the car of your dreams, or you're a person, you love homes, and I gave you the house of your dreams. Now, you can hire a maid to go in and take care of it, but you being the owner, you really going to look it over. We used to laugh about uh, our pilot uh, when, uh, when we owned the plane. We used to laugh about our pilot because we used to say, he treats the plane as if it's his. Because what he would do is, as soon as we landed, he would get out of the plane. And he'd walk around the plane, he'd look down under the plane, and I mean, he's checking absolutely everything out. He'd stand back, and he looked. look, and one day, he was crawling under the plane, and I thought, what is he doing? He found a screw about this long, this long, that had come loose. He took the screw, he called, uh, I forgot who you're supposed to call these flight people who take care of planes, and uh, he asked him. Where did this group come from, and does it matter? See, that's what I'm talking about, ownership, ownership. Now, he being a servant, 
a hired person to look at it so carefully, what do you think Jesus is doing with the house that he owns? Us. He's carefully looking at us. He's carefully considering us. He's watching every aspect of your life. That's why the Bible says he knows the hairs on your head. God is meticulous concerning us. And if we forget that, we can be haphazard about the promises that he gives to us because we think God is haphazard like us. And he's not. He's not. He's got us on his mind. He's got us on his heart. He says we are Jesus' house. And he said we need, to, we need to be joyful over there. We need to be happy that we are God's house. We need to be excited about it. We need to have this great confidence that when we call on Jesus, he's not closing his ears to us. He's a great high priest that rules over us. And then he talks about it in the book of Hebrews. You don't have to turn that 10 and 21. If you'll read, um, starting at verse 21, I think read down to like verse 23. He talks about our conscience. He talks about the fact that he came so our conscience would be clear. He came so that we would not condemn ourselves and put us in a position that he's not put us in. He came so that we wouldn't think less of ourselves. He came so that we wouldn't have a bad attitude concerning us. He came so that we would not say, I, I, I don't qualify for this, or, or God's not going to do this for me, or I got to do this in order to gain this. He says, no, I came to clear your conscience so you wouldn't be trying to figure out how you can get in good standing with me. Then he says in uh, 1 John, he says that because if our conscience condemns us, if what you're thinking about yourself tells you you don't have a right or that you're not good enough or you're not in the position or that you can't have the favor of God, he said, then you're slow to approach God. He said, but Jesus came to fix your conscience, to fix your mind so that you wouldn't think that you didn't qualify. He said, you qualify not because of what you did. You qualify because of who I am. You qualify because of my mercy for you. You can ask God for anything depending on his mercy. Amen. Even when you are guilty. He said, my mercy still extends. Because in the book of Isaiah, he says, you know, I'm the judge. I'm the lawgiver. In this house, I give the laws. They don't come from anything outside. They don't come from what men think. It don't come from even what you do. I'm taking care of my house. Look at somebody say, I'm his house. God is taking care of his house and he is meticulous in taking care of his house. He says, I don't want you to be in a position where your conscience condemns you and say you don't have a right. You have a right. You have every right. You have all the privileges of being in the body of Christ. You have all the privileges of being a son or daughter in the kingdom of God. You have all the privileges of the kingdom of God. That's why he says in Malachi, he said, the windows of heaven are open unto you. They're open. They're always open. Why windows, God? Because there's normally more windows in a house than doors. You have open access to me. Open access. And I need for you to know this. I need for you to know the truth of your position. I need for you to know the truth about your identity. I need to, for you to walk with your head up like you know who you are. And don't you let your conscience condemn you. Don't let it happen not for one minute. Don't let it happen for one second. Don't you succumb to anything that tells you you don't have a right to what's in the house. You have a right to it. As believers, you have a right to it. How did I get to it? I just simply believe what Jesus said. I simply believe that Jesus died on the cross for me. I simply believe 
that when he did, he settled the sin issue. And the sin issue was the only thing that came between me and God. So if the sin issue is solved, then I'm in good. I'm in good. You're in good with God. And he says, I need for you to reflect that. I need for you to walk around with confidence knowing that. So others will want to come to me. But if we walk around condemning people and acting condemned, then why would anybody want to come to God? So you have to know the truth. So you have to look at the word of God and see what's true about you. So you have to look at the word and you reflect what the word says about you because that's who you really are. Taking on a whole new identity. He said, we're new creatures in Christ Jesus. Old things are passed away. I got to get those. Look at somebody say, you got to get that old thinking out of your head. You got to get it out of your head. You got to root it out. You got to read the word of God. You got you to push it out. That takes effort. Look at somebody say, effort. effort. Because there's going to be things that cause you to think that no, nothing has changed. He said, no, but you got to root it out. You got to push it out. You got to look at the word of God and you got to start declaring, this is who I am. You got to start saying, you know what? Only thing, only words that I speak are profitable to people. You got to start declaring that when I open my mouth, the spirit of God is upon me to talk to this person. You got to make sure you don't get involved with foolish questions or questionings. It just, the Bible says it just generates strife. You have to make a decision if people want to know the truth or they're challenging the truth that you know. And you don't quarrel with them. You don't, they're not ready yet. But you keep praying for them that one day you'll be ready. But today you're not ready. And you keep living. You keep living this, this victorious life that God has called us to. And we reflect the word of God. Why? Because of his great mercy. Because of his great mercy towards us. Because of his desire that every man be saved. Every man be saved. And that's what he's telling us to do. You've got to go out and let everybody know. God wants us to go out and let everybody know that God wants a relationship with you, that God wants you, that God wants to be on your side, that God loves you. You've got to go out and make people see God is real, not a fantasy in your imagination, not a figment of your imagination. Not, no, but God is real. Heavenly Father, we just give you praise, we give you honor.